So let's talk about another major motivation for refactoring, which is beyond getting code correct, which is the goal of having a robust test suite and a robust testing process, we care a lot about code maintainability and making code transparent and beautiful and as revealing of design intent as we can for the programmers who come after us. So we might reasonably ask, how do we know if we're succeeding at that? What kind of feedback can we give on how maintainable or how beautiful code is? Are there guidelines, either quantitative or qualitative, that would tell us when we need to improve a piece of code? And how useful are they in practice? So let's talk a little bit about each kind, qualitative things about code and things that you can measure quantitatively about code. And the first qualitative thing is code smells. A code smell is something where the code works correctly, but you look at it and the sort of mature programmer in you says, something doesn't feel right about this code and I can't necessarily put my finger on it. But we can talk about a few of the things that can lead to code smelling bad, so to speak. So I came up with an acronym, and this one is not part of the literature. This is just me, so take it for what it's worth. SOFA, because I couldn't figure out a good way to combine these letters that, that actually spells anything else. But it's a way of capturing four of the top symptoms that can result in a particular method having code smells. So for the moment, we're going to constrain our attention to individual blocks of code, like in a method. But we'll also talk about some guidelines that apply when you're looking at the level of entire classes. Questions to ask when you're evaluating how beautiful or how good code is an individual method. Probably the most important one, and the one that gets violated if you don't do the others, is a method should be short. It should be short enough to read. It used to be, a long time ago, when dinosaurs roamed the Earth, that the definition was, the method should easily fit on one screen full. But this is also when screens were only 24 lines by 80 characters. So today, screens are enormously large, and that guideline doesn't apply anymore. So we'll talk about, quantitatively, what you might look for for methods being short. Does the method do only one thing? Clearly, a method is more likely to be too long if it tries to do multiple things. But there's another reason that it's helpful for a method to do only one thing, because then you can write tests for it. If the method does multiple things, then in some sense, you're writing multiple tests, and you should be asking yourself, well, why is this multiple methods? And we'll look at how to sort of do that process in just a moment. Does the method have relatively few arguments? This one doesn't seem so obvious. Like, why should you care how many arguments it has? Well, think about what could cause a proliferation of arguments, right? There's two sort of main scenarios where a method ends up taking a lot of arguments. One of them is the arguments really are all related to each other. So just to give sort of a, a stupidly trivial example, if there's a method that takes as arguments somebody's name, street, city, zip code, email, and phone number, it's a pretty good bet that those things actually are related to each other, right? Those are not really independent arguments. In fact, you could argue there is a class waiting to be defined whose instance variables are all those different properties. So one kind of scenario is you have arguments that seem to always travel around in a little group, and it's really because those arguments are related to each other and maybe should be encapsulated in their own class. And then you would just pass the method an instance of that class instead. The other scenario where you can end up with more arguments than you want is that the arguments really are controlling different aspects of the behavior of that method. And again, to take a stupidly trivial example, if there's an argument that's Boolean, and the behavior of the method is in some way conditioned on the Boolean value of the argument, then I would argue, get it, I would argue? I would argue you really have two methods. One of them is a behavior when the Boolean is false, and one of them is a behavior when the Boolean is true. So in that case, you could split out the two methods and just have a higher level method that dispatches to the correct one. And finally, does it have a consistent level of abstraction? I'll show you an example of this, but what I mean by that is, all of the statements in a given method should do one of two things. Either all of them should be talking about what is to be done, or all of them should be talking about how a specific thing is being done. If you end up mixing those, where some lines of a function are saying what to do, but others are diving into details about how to do certain things, it is very likely that you're violating at least one of these other ones and making the code hard to read, and I will give you an example of how that might occur. By the way, as with everything in Rails, is there a tool that will help you find code smells? Why, yes. Yes, there is. Uh, it is called Reek. And if you know the English vernacular, it's, it's kind of a, you know, I think it's kind of a funny choice because to say that something reeks is to say that it has a really bad smell of something.
So let's talk about what I mean by single level of abstraction. A method that is trying to do complex things should really be doing divide and conquer. And my analogy for divide and conquer is kind of when you read a well-written piece of journalism, a news story. A news story starts with the first paragraph being kind of a summary of the key points. And then after that, there's individual paragraphs that go into detail on the main points of the topic paragraph. As opposed to something that just sort of starts from the beginning and rambles on till the end, rather than sort of starting with the overall outline and then kind of progressively refining it down. So what does this mean for code? For me, it means that you think of a complex task as having kind of what I'll call a top-level method that outlines the high-level steps of doing the task, but it delegates the details to the helper method. So let me actually walk you through a live example. Um, this is a refactoring that I did a few years ago, and I have to set a little bit of context for you. Here's an app where customers have the ability to opt in or opt out of being on an email list, but if somebody has recently opted out of the email list, then the next time they come to the app, you would like to give them a polite little nudge and reminder asking them if they want to opt back in. So that's the problem that this code is trying to solve. And the original code that does this, this is the action in customer's controller that is called as soon as a successful login happens. So once somebody logs in, this is basically the first page they're going to see. Don't worry about trying to parse the code, but here is what I would want you to observe about it at a high level. First of all, it mixes multiple levels of abstraction. So you know, there's a whole bunch of detailed stuff in here, but there's also just saying set the flash notice to some message. It also exposes a lot of implementation details. So in particular, what I said was when the customer logs in, if they've recently opted out of email, welcome them back. Well, by having all of this code in here, we're basically exposing the implementation of what it means for someone to recently have opted out of email. Right? So this is an example of separating the what from the how. The what is, has the customer recently opted out of email? The how is, how do we make the decision of whether that's true? And this is not the right place for that information, right? If there's a customer model, you could argue that that's probably where the decision should be made about which attributes of the customer are the ones that are going to tell me if they're supposed to be someone that this condition applies to or not. There's also a hidden assumption here. Look at the way that I'm setting flash notice using the standard Ruby idiom of the, the double bar equals. And as you recall, what that means is at this point in the code, if flash notice is nil, then it will be assigned whatever m happens to be. But if flash notice is not nil, then its value won't change. So if to the extent that this code might be correct, it's only correct if I am able to make an assumption about what the value of flash notice is before this action gets called. And I can't really make that assumption. Maybe there's a controller before filter that already put something in flash notice, in which case this code just silently won't work. So there's a lot of problems here, because now the developer has to know this unstated assumption, and you've exposed information that isn't really the controller's job to know. So what would be a nicer way to do this? Here's the version that I ended up with after doing a few refactorings. In a moment, we're going to actually do a refactoring of a different real method uh, to sort of show step by step how you get to that point. But take a look at the top level. There's now a helper message called login message. And basically, if you read this, it's almost like reading a comment. right? So the power of short methods that do one thing and have well-chosen names is that you could essentially read this like a sentence in English, and you could figure out what this high-level helper is trying to do. What about the encourage opt-in message itself? How is that done? Well, now I've separated out the implementation of how do I know what that message is? It turns out that our customers, meaning the, the people who administer the system, they wanted to be able to de define the specific text of what the user sees if they're in this situation. So we had to actually store it in a table of customer settable options. And now we have essentially hidden that implementation decision in a method whose name says what the method does, but whose steps say how to do that thing. And finally, the idea of how do we know if somebody has opted out of email? Well, there is a customer model, and you could argue that that model is the place where that information belongs. So in the model, we can actually change the definition of what it means to have opted out, and the rest of the code paths don't have to worry about that anymore. So now, the only thing we have to do in the customer's controller is we set flash notice to either the login message, if there is one, or if not, just a plain old logged in successfully. So look at all the different places where knowledge has been removed here. The helper method uh, is defined so that the name of it says what to do, but the body tells how to do it. 
and the responsibility for knowing the implementations of things have been moved to places where they're more appropriate. In particular, it's almost never the controller's job to know this stuff. And now the controller can just limit its responsibility to calling the helpers, right? So move information to where it belongs, give it a good name, and as a side effect of that, you will end up with a situation where your individual methods are a lot more nicely structured and are more likely to follow the SOFA guidelines. What about lots of arguments? Let's get back to why lots of arguments is bad. Part of it is that the arguments really are controlling behaviors in the function, then it's harder to get good test coverage because you have to find ways to exercise all the different code paths corresponding to different permutations of those argument values. It also means that it's hard to mock or stub it while testing because depending on what those arguments are, if each of those arguments is an object whose methods are called by the code you're testing, you have to create quite a bit of mocking and stubbing just to be able to call the method under test at all. I already mentioned that Boolean arguments should sort of be a yellow flag for this, except in very limited cases, Boolean arguments probably mean what you really have is two different methods and you should treat it as such. And as I mentioned, if the arguments seem to actually be related to each other, and whenever you pass one of them, you're passing the whole group of them, then maybe you need to extract a class that has those arguments as its attributes, and then you can just pass instances of the class around. So if you see the same set of arguments being passed to a lot of methods, that's a signal that this might be the reason. So those are a couple of qualitative things. What about quantitative things? What are some quantitative measurements of code complexity? A really simple one that's been around for a long time, but is surprisingly useful, is assignment branch and condition complexity, where you basically take a weighted sum of the number of assignments, the number of branches, as defined by these particular keywords, and the number of conditions, meaning one clause of a condition statement. The typical weighted sum is you take the, squ the square root of the sum of the squares. The National Institute of Standards and Technology, which sets standards for just about everything in the United States, has established a recommendation that this value should be less than about 20 for a single function. And yes, if you're going to ask, there is in fact a tool for Rails that will check the ABC complexity. So let's take a look at an example of a drastic reduction in ABC complexity. These are two real but anonymized submissions from an early chips where you have to combine the anagrams of words. So basically, you're given a bunch of words and you have to return the words grouped by which ones are anagrams of the same thing. So the code on the left works and you can spend your time trying to go through it, or the refactored version is the code on the right, which does exactly the same thing. Right? It makes better use of idioms. It certainly has a much lower flog score. So one of the benefits of refactoring is often that you can actually make your complexity go down by looking for more efficient ways to do things. Another quantitative measure is what's called cyclomatic complexity. And cyclomatic complexity is trying to capture how many different paths are there through a block of code. So if we define it, basically what you do is you create a graph that corresponds to the control flow and you count the number of edges, nodes, and connected components in the graph. Here's a simple example of a method that has a while loop and it's got an if statement with no else clause. And if you sort of tried to represent this, you've got nodes for the beginning point and you know, the entry point and the exit point. In between, you've got a loop that has the body of the while and then you've got a conditional that may or may not be followed. So if you just count up the edges, nodes and components in this graph, you get a cyclomatic complexity of three, which is not bad because again, NIST has a recommendation that a score of less than about 10 per module is pretty good. And you can pretty easily see, like what are the kinds of things that could screw up and give you a much higher cyclomatic complexity? Obviously, if a method is just plain too long, there are more statements and you will get a higher ABC score. And remember that you're squaring each of the components, right? So the effect is super linear. If you have a method that has nested conditionals, that's going to screw it up as well. So the idea behind these quantitative metrics is not that any single metric is the truth or that any single metric is the most important metric. Really what you're looking for is places where there are multiple metrics giving you yellow flags about your code. And to do that, there is yet another Rails tool. There is a gem called Metric Foo, which collects a whole bunch of different static code analysis metrics. And essentially, if you run it, it will give you, you know, not just the metrics I showed you now, but like five or six different others. What you're looking for is hotspots. You're looking for places where there are multiple things wrong with your code. There is a service I love, which again, I have no connection, financial or otherwise, but it's called Code Climate. And if you check out Code Climate, you can hook it up to your GitHub repo and every time you push new code, it will run a whole bunch of analyses like this, and it will give each file in your project a GPA, like on a letter graded GPA scale.
And basically, this is what it's doing. GPAs that are bad are a result of files where multiple things are wrong. There are multiple code smells. The quantitative complexity metrics are too high. So it's very helpful at sort of spotting where are the parts in your code base that really need the most love.